Bibles and turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 5. We'll pick it up at verse number 11 there. 1 John, chapter number 5. Certainly appreciate everybody being here today. I know most of you, if this is your church home, you knew that Pastor Price was not going to be here today, and you came anyway, and for that I am grateful. And uh, many of you know who I am, and you knew I was going to be preaching today, and you still came. And uh, I'm just very appreciative of that, so thank you so much for, for being here. This morning, and I understand there's quite a few guests here as well, as well. and I just want to welcome you. Just so you know, I'm a guest here. Uh, we're from South Carolina, and I'm an evangelist and have the privilege to travel the country and, and preach the gospel so that people might understand how they can be born again, have their, home, uh, have their uh, sins forgiven, and have a home in heaven. So we are certainly uh, grateful uh, that you are here. And I don't think I've got a chance to meet any of the visitors, so uh, if given the opportunity, I would love to be able to shake your hand and, and introduce myself to you uh, here this morning. Now, I wouldn't normally do this as a visitor, but I'm going to make a, a statement about your pastor just simply because uh, of the special offering that you're taking up uh, for them. And uh, I have known your pastor now for a little over two years, and um, I just want to say this. I have never been around them or seen them when they are not working. Um, they work harder than almost anybody I know. Um, I, it was uh, one evening, I forget what it was, I, I think I had, I had just gotten into town and I've uh, been spending a lot of time here lately and I think we had, uh, some of the men had gotten together and we had gone out on visitation. And when we came back in, I opened the door and Mrs. Price was on her hands and knees back there in that corner cleaning the floor. And she's always doing something like that. And Pastor Price is always doing it. He's pastoring two churches. Um, most pastors I know uh, wear down pastoring one. And uh, he's trying to do two. And uh, the one down in Miami uh, Beach, a church plant, I need an awful lot of work down there. Still needs an awful lot of work. And I just want you to know that they work. And uh, I, am, I am very encouraged to, to know them. And I just wanted to read a, a verse from 1 Thessalonians 5. You don't have to turn there. But verse number 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. You know that word, labor? work, isn't it? And I want to tell you, just from, from what I know of your pastor and, and his wife, they are laborers. And uh, man, I'll tell you, they are workers. It says, um, know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their works sake. And uh, you know, I just encourage you to dig deep, if I can say it that way, uh, for the Christmas offering. Uh, they work hard. Uh, they're very giving people. Um, somebody's always staying in their house. Uh, people are staying in their house right now. And uh, so you can see that that testimony is true. And um, I had to twist our arms and convince them to let us stay elsewhere so that we wouldn't be staying with them uh, when we came down here. 
and uh, we just felt like um, we were going to be here for almost a month, and that might be too long, and it worked out well, so uh, you guys could be there because we aren't. And, uh, but they were just insisting and trying to get us to stay with them, even for a month. Now, you know something about a company, right? It stinks after three days. And they were willing to have us come in and do homeschool in their house for almost a month. And I just, uh, I really appreciate them. And um, anyway, they, they are real workers. And um, as from traveling the country and, and being in different churches all the time, um, he shines out like a bright, shining star of laborers in the church. And so I want you to know that um, from a guest perspective, a guest speaker's perspective, uh, your pastor and his wife are special. And I hope that you'll dig deep and give them a special gift uh, there uh, for Christmas. So that's not uh, why I'm here, and he didn't pay me to say that, all right? That was just from my observations. First John chapter number 5. Uh, let's look at it there in verse number 11. The Bible says this, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may... Would you say the next word with me? No. no. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Would you bow in prayer with me this morning? Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here. And uh, thank you for allowing me to preach your word. Thank you for those that have gathered here together. We know that you are here in the midst. And uh, Father, we just ask that you would be honored, Lord, as we preach and teach your word. Father, I pray for each and every one of us. Perhaps there's somebody here who is struggling about this issue of, of whether or not they have eternal life, and whether or not their sins have been forgiven. Father, I pray that clarity would be given this morning. And Father, I pray ultimately, above all, that you uh, would be honored. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you know that you know that you have a home in heaven? When you lay down at night and you pillow your head, can you go to sleep in peace because you know that you're saved and that your sins have been forgiven and that you have a home in heaven? I hope that you can. That is the intent of the Bible. That you might have peace and that it might be a, at rest, it might be a settled issue, the issue of your salvation. It is not a God's design according to His Word that you may wonder if you have eternal life. It is not the design according to God's Word that you may just merely hope that you have eternal life. It is God's design according to His Word that you K-N-O-W, that you know with confidence that you have eternal life. And I'm telling you, friends, it's the only way to live. There are groups of people out there who teach that the Bible teaches that you can lose your salvation. The Bible says no such thing. Time and time and time again, the Bible declares to us that we can know for sure that we have eternal life and that eternal life lasts forever. And that is simple to receive. The Bible says there in verse number 11, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in His Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he that hath the Son hath life. What kind of life? Eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, hath not eternal life. Okay? So, you have eternal life if you have the Son. Now, that begs the question, doesn't it? How do you get the Son? If it takes getting the Son to have eternal life, then, then how do I do that? How does one go about getting the Son? Stay in the uh, same book here, but just look in the chapter before, in 1 John chapter 4, and uh, we'll pick it up there in verse number 15. The Bible says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to be, what? The Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God... God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So that's how you get the Son, by confessing that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that he is the Savior of the world. Now, this uh, concept of Jesus being the Savior of the world is an interesting one, and I think it begs another question that we must ask ourselves, what do we need to be saved from? Why is he the Savior of the world? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that there is none righteous. There is none that doeth good, 
No, not one. For all have what? Sin. Sin. And come short of the glory of God. And the Bible goes on and, and tells us that the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. And death there means eternal separation from God forever. The Bible makes it very clear that if a person does not have the Son, if the person does not have the forgiveness of their sin, that they will spend an eternity in a very real place, the Bible refers to as hell, the lake of fire. There's a judgment to be paid. The wages of our sin, what we deserve for the wrong that we have done, is an eternity without God, apart from God, in hell where there are real flames that burn, and there you will be tormented for all of eternity in a place the Bible refers to as hell, the lake of fire. There's a punishment for sin. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to, to be happy that God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Because I am a sinner. And if you're honest with yourself, you would admit that too. You're a sinner. We've all done things uh, bad. We've all fallen short of God's expectations. We've all broken God's commandments. Haven't we not? We are all sinners. And the Bible declares that to be the case. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, the Bible also goes on further to explain to us that salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. And that salvation is a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, a lot of people think that uh, you have to be good to get to heaven. You know, good people will go to heaven, and bad people will go to hell. But, you know, that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, I'm glad that uh, when a person does get saved and, and they call their name after Christ, there is a change that takes place in their life. So in a sense, I understand Christians should be good people, right? But the Bible does not teach that good works are what gets a person to heaven. You know, why? Because we can't be good enough. The standard there is Jesus Christ, God's Son, and there's not a single person in this room, even if you stop sinning from this day forward, which, by the way, is impossible, even if you stop sinning from this day forward, the history that you've already recounted to me that you're a sinner would nullify you from being able to spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ because you've fallen short. And sin is the problem, and we need to be saved from our sin. The Bible says very clearly we're all sinners. We all deserve to spend an eternity in hell, and there's nothing that we can do to earn or merit our own way to heaven. I can't go to church enough to get to heaven. I can't give enough money to Pastor Price and his wife for their Christmas gift to get to heaven. I can't uh, be moral enough to get to heaven. I cannot get to heaven in and of my own efforts. I can't pray enough to get to heaven. I can't be a nice enough person to get to heaven. I can't be a good enough employee to get to heaven. There is nothing that I can do in and of myself to earn or merit the forgiveness of my sins. But, thankfully, God loves you and me. Aren't you so glad about that? For God so loved the world. That's you, and that's me, and I'm thankful for that, right? That He sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, God the Father took all the sins in the world and He placed them onto Jesus Christ His Son. He took your sin off of you, He took my sin off of me, and He placed them onto His Son, Jesus Christ, on that cross that we sang about this morning. And there on that cross, God punished Jesus for the wrong things that you have done. He punished Jesus for your sin. He took your payment. He was your substitute. And then he died, he was buried, and three days later he what? He rose again. Praise the Lord. Amen for that. He rose again, and today he sits on the right hand of the Father. He's the Savior of the world. And the Bible says in order to get to the Son, you must believe that he is the Savior of the world. You must believe that you are a sinner. You must believe that the penalty for your sin is eternal damnation in a place called hell. You must believe that there's nothing good that you can do in and of yourself to earn or merit your way to heaven. The only thing you can do is look to Jesus Christ and call out and cry out for Him to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise for you, and that's a promise for me. Salvation is simple. It's something that, uh, uh, so easy that a child can do. When I was uh, five years old, I took that step of faith. I understood that I was a sinner. I understood I needed to go to, uh, to hell because of my sin. I understood that I couldn't be good enough to get my own way to heaven. And so I cried out for Jesus to be my Savior. You know, I was fine. It's not simple. A lot of people think that uh, we have to grow up and have all this knowledge of the Bible and all this stuff, you know, and get all this understanding before we can be saved. But you know, it's the exact opposite. The Bible says, lest you come unto me as one of these little ones. 
you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The adults need to become more like children in order to get saved. It's just a simple transaction of faith. I trust and rely upon Jesus and His finished work on the cross of Calvary uh, for the forgiveness of my sins and a home in heaven. And if you have done that, then the Bible says that you are saved. And that is the record that we are reading about here in uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I want to share just a brief testimony with you from my own life. I got saved when I was five. I've already mentioned that. And I uh, was confident in my salvation when I was five years old. I can remember things uh, about the next few days and playing on the playground uh, uh, with children and wondering if they were saved and wondering if they were going to spend an eternity in heaven and having a burden for lost people. I remember a lot of those things. But uh, by the time I got around to high school, I wasn't so sure anymore. And I began to doubt that simple transaction of faith that I had when I was five years old. And I began to wonder if I was really saved. In other words, I didn't K-N-O-W for sure that my sins were forgiven and I, home in heaven, and I had a home in heaven. And you know, there's a lot of people who have doubts like this. And that this message, the rest of this message is for those of you who may be doubting your salvation. And I hope that it will be a help to you. But one thing I just want to mention before we get to the explanation of doubt and why it is that we doubt our salvation, I just want us to consider briefly who is eligible for salvation. Would you look in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1, and tell me the first word that you see? Shout it out loud and clear. Whosoever. Whosoever. Would you say it again nice and loud? Whosoever. I'm telling you, there isn't a better word in all the Bible. Whosoever. Whosoever. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. God, that's salvation. That's being born again. We sang about that this morning as well. Whosoever. Listen, because the Bible says whosoever, guess what that means? That means you can have your sins forgiven. That means you can have a home in heaven. That means you can trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Whosoever. I'm a whosoever. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. You're still a whosoever. Amen. We've all done wrong things. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That puts us all in the same playing field. It's level at the foot of the cross. The Bible says whosoever, and I just tell you, we can just shout and rejoice about that the rest of this morning and the rest of the day and the rest of the week and the rest of this year and all of next, that the Bible says whosoever can be saved. You know, if the Bible said whosoever and then put some sort of category, category on there to, to, to limit whosoever, nobody in this room could be saved. But thankfully, there's no limiting statement applied to whosoever. It just says whosoever. So if you're here this morning, you are a whosoever. And if you will simply agree to the facts of the gospel, that you're a sinner, that you deserve hell, that you can't get to heaven in and of yourself, and you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Bible says you can be saved. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall what? call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a wonderful word. So anybody can be saved. And we've seen that as well. Now, why is it that people doubt their salvation? This is not a comprehensive list, but I do want to just discuss some of these uh, errors that people have and uh, reasons that cause uh, us to doubt uh, our salvation. Uh, error number one, explanation of doubt, would be this. Uh, basing your salvation on your feelings. Salvation is not... A feel. Now, sometimes it feels good to be saved, doesn't it? Yeah. I like that, right? But you know what? Sometimes, even when you don't feel saved, you can still know that you're saved because of the truth of the facts that are presented in the Word of God. Now, I just want us to show a, a verse on this. Hold your finger here in First John as we will come back. But turn to Matthew uh, chapter number 11. I just want to read a few verses. I find this completely fascinating. When we consider those of us who, who could, uh, you know, have, have some doubt because we've been uh, placing our salvation on our feelings, Matthew chapter 11, uh, we'll begin looking there in verse number 2. The Bible says, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Now this is John the Baptist that's being talked, spoken of here. Okay, so he is uh, there and he's in prison. And when he heard the words of Christ, he sent two of his disciples 
and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Right? Now, this is just astounding if you'll stop and think about it. Okay? This is John the Baptist. The greatest prophet who has ever walked on the face of the earth according to the testimony of Jesus Christ himself. The greatest prophet, all right, the preacher in the wilderness, the preparer of the way of Christ, the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, the one who heard the voice of God from heaven, the one who saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus and setting on him as a dove, the one who saw all of this and experienced all of this is now in prison and he's saying, I need to send two of my disciples to go see if Jesus is who he really says he is. You know what I think is happening here? I think John the Baptist isn't feeling so well. Where's he at? He's in prison. You know what? Circumstances can be tough, can't they? And I think that even John the Baptist here is starting to feel because of these circumstances that, you know what? I'm not sure that Jesus is who he says that he is. And I suggest to you this. If John the Baptist can doubt who Jesus is, so can you, and so can I. What is the solution for doubting or basing your salvation on your feelings? It's to go back to the book and to look at the plain and clear words that are presented in Scripture. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus does to John the Baptist here. Would you look at it in verse 4? The Bible says, Jesus answered, so these two disciples came unto him. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. You know what all of those are? Those are prophecies from the Old Testament scriptures about what the promised Messiah will do. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus go and... And, and have a meeting with John and sit down with John and explain to him that he was Jesus the Christ? No, he didn't. You know what he did? He referred them to the Scriptures. That is the exact way that you and I can have confidence in our salvation today. If we will go back and focus on the promises of Scripture. Go back and look. Go back and look at the record. The things that we've been talked about this morning. Go back and look at John chapter 3, verse 16. Say, have I done that? If you've done that, and if you've agreed to those facts, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then your faith must be placed into the written Word of God so that you can have confidence and know for sure that you are saved. You know, feelings change, don't they? Feelings are like a, an emotional roller coaster. You know, sometimes I feel good, and sometimes I feel bad, right? And if we base our salvation on our feelings, sometimes we're going to feel saved, and sometimes we're not going to feel saved. And that's not God's plan. God's desire for you is that you would know that it will be settled and that it would be done and that it would be confident. Here's another reason that people doubt their salvation. Uh, Satan's a liar, isn't he? And uh, he causes us to doubt the very words of God. Genesis chapter number 3. If you just want to flip over there real quickly. Genesis chapter number 3. Satan uh, has been doing this ever since uh, the garden. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, Now the serpent, Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Had God very clearly said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Yes, he did. He gave very explicit instructions. And you can go back in chapter 2 and you can read those very explicit instructions. They were very clear. They were able to eat of all the trees of the, in, in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, Satan, here he comes and he casts doubt on that which is very clearly said by God. It's what he did in Genesis chapter 3, and it's what he will still do to us today. To get us to cast doubt on the Word of God. What's the solution to that? To get in the Word of God and to read it. And to just focus on it and meditate on it and understand that this is the Word of God and that it is true and that it is trustworthy. John 17, 17, Thy Word is truth. And then we must focus there and uh, get our concentration back onto the words of God and recognize that Satan's a liar. And he's always trying to get us to, count, uh, to doubt uh, the words of God and uh, that we can, we can focus there. I think that there's another reason that people doubt their salvation. There's a, a lot of confusion on what it means... Uh, to keep yourself saved. Would you look in John chapter number 10? 
John chapter number 10, <coughs> verses 28 and 29. Okay? A lot of people think that, uh, you know, you trust in Jesus Christ um, as a sinner. You call out on Him to save you. And uh, He does so, but then, you know, it's up to you to keep yourself saved. And that's not the teaching of the Scriptures either. Right? And we'll take a look at that here. John chapter 10, verse 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life. This is Jesus speaking. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Would everybody look up here just for a minute? A lot of people had this idea. Uh, when they get saved, uh, we'll let this hand represent God, okay? and we'll let this hand represent you. Uh, when you get saved, um, you, you grab onto God. Okay? And then they think that, uh, you know, as long as you keep having your devotions and, and you go out and you're a soul winner and, and you're doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing and, and you're fighting against the sin in your life, that you'll hold on to God. But you know what? If, if maybe, um, you know, some things happen in your life and, and you stop having your devotions every day and, um, you know what, you slip a little. And, and, and then something else comes up and, and, and you stop doing something else and you slip away. And, and after time, they'll think, well, they can fall away and that they can lose their salvation, right? That's what a lot of people think. Uh, you go out here and talk to people in Fort Lauderdale, and you're going to find a lot of people who think that they can lose their salvation, that they can fall away from God. But, you know, I'm so thankful that John, uh, John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29 are in the Bible. Okay? All right, let me show you the real illustration, okay? Uh, let's let this hand represent us again, okay? The Bible says when a person gets saved, we are placed into what? God's hand. Okay? And then, you know what happens? Um, if we try to get out of there, guess what? He still got us. And the Bible says, no man is able to pluck me out of my Father's hands. You know what that is? That's Amen. security of salvation. It's a done deal. He has you. Uh, First Peter says that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation. We are in His hand and He has a hold of us and no man can pluck us out of His hand. So what does it take to stay saved once you get saved? Nothing. Just existing. Right? That's it. That's it. You get saved, you're always going to be saved. Do you deserve that? No, you don't. But I'm so glad that God is gracious, aren't you? Without the grace of God, every one of us would lose our salvation every day. But I'm so thankful that God is gracious, even more so than I can even understand. And just because, as a five-year-old child, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm still saved today as a 39-year-old man. It's amazing. Do I deserve to still be saved today? No. Am I saved today? Yes. Because of what I did when I was a five-year-old boy. You know, maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've never trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior. You can. All it takes is just trusting in Jesus, calling out to Him for your salvation from sin and hell, and He'll save you just like He did me when I was a young man. Uh, there are other things that we could look at there, but just for sake of time, let's move on. I want us to just think for a moment about the eternality of eternal life. Would you look in John? We're already there. Look in John chapter 5 and verse number 24. John chapter 5 and verse number 24. The Bible says, Verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, this is in red letters, this is Jesus speaking, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. All right, now this is Sunday morning. I know that uh, I'm not supposed to ask for feedback from the congregation. That's just not what's done, right? But let's do it this morning. Pastor's out of town, all right? What does eternal mean? It means forever. Could I say it this way? It means without end, okay? So, if you have eternal life, it literally means you have life that's going to last forever that will never end. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And that's the word that's used in Scripture. Does the words in Scripture, do they have meaning for us today? Absolutely. I hang my salvation on the very words that Scripture uses. Okay, And I hope that you do too. Because that's the only way we can find confidence in our salvation. All right? So look up here and uh, let's play a little game. All right? All right? I got saved when I was how old? Five. Five. All right? So here I am on a timeline. We're going to make uh, this a timeline across the stage. Here I am when I'm five years old. All right? I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. What kind of life do I have according to John chapter 5 and verse number 24? Eternal. Eternal life. Life that lasts forever and life that will never end. Okay? Now, I'm here on the timeline. All right? Now I'm six years old. Okay? What kind of life do I have? Eternal. 
I have everlasting life. Why? Because it's life that lasts forever that will never end. All right? Now, let's fast forward a little ways. Now I'm 20. Okay? All the good old days. All right? What kind of life do I have? Everlasting. Everlasting, eternal life. Life without end left that lasts forever. Let's fast forward all the way to today when I'm 39. Woo! What kind of life do I have today? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Do I have everlasting life because I'm a preacher? Oh, I'm sorry. This is a splash zone here in the front. Because I'm a preacher? No. Why do I have everlasting life? Because I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was five. That's amazing, isn't it? I get to be a preacher today. I get to serve the Lord today. But it's not at all what I'm counting on to get me to heaven. If I'm counting on being a preacher to get me to heaven, I won't make it. Because I have to be counting on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross to forgive me of my sins. That's the only way a person gets to heaven. All right, now, let's make this a little bit interesting. We're going to go down the timeline here. Now I'm 75. Okay? But what you don't know about my life is from 39 to 75... After I preach this message this morning, I walk out those doors and I say, never again am I coming back to church. I'm done with this nonsense. I stop reading my Bible. I fall off into some horrible kinds of sin. And for the next 25 years, I waste my life. And now I'm 75. What kind of life do I have? I have eternal life! Why? Because of a decision I made when I was five. To trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And He gave me eternal life. The Bible does not say that He gave me probationary life. So that I can lose it if I mess up. Now, just so you know, I'm not planning to walk out those doors and never come back. I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ for the rest of my life because of His graciousness to me. Why do I preach? Because God loves me. Why do I serve Him? Because God loves me and He saved me. And I didn't deserve any of that. But yet, He did. And yet, He keeps me saved. And because there's nothing I can do to lose my salvation, it gives me the confidence to serve Him with everything that I have. Because He is so good to me. I want to spend my life serving Him. Now, if I had walked away from the Lord, I'd receive no reward for that time in my life. I would suffer a lot of pain and a lot of consequences for sin. I'm not saying life would be good. But I'm saying I couldn't have lost my eternal life can't do that because God's gracious you know the Bible also talks about being placed into the family of God for the sake of time we won't turn there but Galatians chapter 4 verses 5 to 7 1 John 3 1 are verses that you could look up sometime I'm placed in the family of God right are you in here would you stand up this is my daughter everybody say hi Riley hi. Hi. Riley. Riley's 12 okay. I am so blessed that God has given Riley to me as her father and she's my daughter. And I have another daughter who's back there in the back. Her name is Ainsley. Okay? Let's suppose that Riley decides, and I hope that this never happens, that she hates me. Okay? And she walks out one day when she gets older and she says, I don't want anything to do with, anymore with dad and mom, whatever else. Is there anything that she can do in her life that keeps her from being my daughter? Mm -hmm. Nothing. She's always going to be my daughter. And I'm always going to love her, no matter how she treats me. Thank you, Riley. Sit down. Now, that's the relationship that you have with God. He places you into His family and calls you His son. And I don't care what you do. Once you're a son, you're always a son. You're always a son. You are placed into the family, the very family of God. And there's nothing, nothing that can change that once you're in. The same word eternal. Again, for the sake of time, we won't turn there. Everlasting and eternal are both used to describe God Himself. References 1 Timothy 1.17, Romans 16.26, verses for you to look up some other time. If salvation is not forever, then God is not forever. Do you believe God is forever? I believe God is forever because the Bible says He's forever. And I believe eternal life lasts as long as God because the same words are used to describe God and the kind of life that He gives us when we trust Him as our Savior. It's amazing. We don't earn it, but we, we get it if we just meet the requirements. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We're almost done here. I say we're almost done, but at least 10 minutes, right? That's like the worst thing a preacher can say, we're almost done. They never really mean it. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5, the Bible says this, 
examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Can I ask everybody here this morning to do this with me? Would you examine yourself this morning and ask yourself this question? Am I saved? And do I know it? Am I in the faith? That's what 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says. We are to examine ourselves. Now, before we get too much into our examination, if you walked into a dentist's office and uh, one of your teeth were really hurting you, right, really bad, and you needed to have that tooth extracted, right, pulled out, okay? And uh, you're sitting there, and the doctor, the dentist, walks into the room, and he cranks up a chainsaw, Right? and comes after you with your mouth, what are you going to do? You're going to run for your life, right? Why? Because he's using the wrong tools, right, for the procedure that needs to be done, okay? So if we're going to examine ourselves, we need to make sure that we're going to use the right instruments for the examination, okay? Now let me ask you a question. For those of us who are saved and know it, are you saved by works? No. 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 Let me ask you a question. Then why do you bring works into the examination room to settle your salvation. You're not saved by works, so don't bring works into the examination of whether or not you're saved. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? Now I'm going to use a Bible illustration here for this purpose. Okay? I'm going to use the Old Testament character of Lot. And again, for the sake of time, we won't look at some of the scriptures, but in the New Testament, uh, we know from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, that Lot was a saved man. Okay? He was righteous, okay? and his righteous soul was vexed uh, from day to day in the city of Lot. Okay? Now, what do we know about Lot? Okay? And uh, think about this in, in Lot's works. Okay? Did Lot love the brethren? No, I think he separated from Abraham, didn't he? Okay? So Lot didn't love the brethren. Did Lot keep God's commandments? No, he, where did he end up living? Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. All right. Did Lot live the life that he should have lived? Of course not. Okay. He lived his life uh, in and amongst sinners. He, he lost his family there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Does anything in Lot's life show that he's saved? Not really. Okay. Did Lot purify himself because he knew that the Lord was coming back one day? No. Okay. Did Lot live a lifestyle of sin? Yes. Okay. Did Lot love the world more than God? Yes. By the way, for those of you who are in Sunday school this morning, okay, it sounds to me like there were some thorns that were choking out some things that he loved more than God that kept him from being fruitful in his life. That wasn't planned, but that was free, all right? Did Lot overcome the world? No. Did Lot's children get saved? No. Was Lot saved? Yes, he was. Now, if Lot had brought in works into his life, into the examination room to determine his salvation, he'd probably determine that he wasn't, he wasn't saved. Okay? Now, listen, Lot should have done some examining in his life, okay? But he doesn't need to bring works to the table whenever it's whether or not he's saved. Okay? Salvation is a simple faith transaction that a person makes, okay? So, let me just say this as well. You know, you can take a, a works-based test for salvation and a devout Catholic is going to pass it. Hmm. They're oftentimes more devoted than we are. But the difference between a devout Catholic and us, I hope, that are here is a devout Catholic is trusting in those works to get himself to heaven. Okay? A works-based test is not good to uh, guarantee ourselves of our salvation. So we need to exclude works from the examination room. Okay? Now, if we're going to exclude works, what should we include? We need to enlarge the works of Jesus Christ. We need to enlarge the works of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. He's the perfect sinless Son of God. What happened to Jesus when He died on the cross? My sin was placed upon Him. He died for me. We're enlarging what Christ did. We're taking the focus off of ourselves. We're not looking at our works. We're looking at Christ. What did Christ do for me? Not what I'm doing for Christ when it comes to settling this issue of salvation. We're enlarging the works of Jesus Christ. What do I trust in for eternal life? That's a good question to bring into the examination room. 
Am I trusting in my church attendance? Am I trusting in my baptism? Am I trusting in my giving of the, my finances? Am I trusting of, of doing good deeds? Am I trusting in my Bible reading to get me to heaven? Those would all be questions that you can ask yourself. By the way, the answer is, if you answer yes to any of those, your faith is not placed in the proper place. <clears throat> is my faith placed solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? That's the only place it can be for you to have the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ offers. Okay? A couple of examples to consider here, and then we are finishing. I am wrapping up. Okay? How do you know, or how do you prove, okay, that you're married? Okay? okay? Do you evaluate your love for the other person? No. Do you consider if you live together? No. Do you look at whether or not you share your money? No. Do you consider what other people think? No. Do you evaluate your feelings? and how you feel about that person. No. You know what you have to do? You have to go get the record. You have to get the record of your marriage license. And you hold up that record and you say, look, this proves that I am married. I have the record. Okay? Now, how do you know that you own a car? Do you own a car because you just, uh, you really enjoy driving it? Listen, there are a lot of cars I would really enjoy driving that aren't mine. Okay? Um, do you know that you own a car because you park it in your garage? No, you could rent a car and park it in your garage, couldn't you? Do you know that you own a car because you wash it and detail it and baby everything about it, right? No. Do you know that you own a car because you pay for it? Do you know that you own a car because you just look really cool behind the wheel? No. How do you know and prove that you own a car? you got to show the record. You have to show the title. Listen, how do you know for sure that you're saved? How do you know for sure that you're saved? Do you know you're saved because you keep His commandments? No. Do you know you're saved because you love the brethren? Do you know you're saved because you just love reading the Bible? No. Do you know that you're saved because you attend church regularly? No. Do you know that you're saved because you've been baptized? No. How do you know that you're saved? You have to show the record. Do you have the Son? Have you trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior? I hope that you'll all examine yourselves this morning. And if you have some questions about anything that I've said, I'd love to talk to you after the service. I'm going to ask my wife to come forward to the piano. She's just going to play a simple song, At the Cross, page 129. And uh, we'll just stand to our feet, if you would, where you're at. And I'm going to say a word, uh, close in prayer, and then she's going to play and we'll have an invitation. And uh, we won't even sing this morning. We'll just let the piano play uh, quietly. So if you just stand to your feet. I'm going to bow my head and pray. Father, I thank you for the time we've had to spend together. Father, I pray, Lord, as we are all here in this examining room this morning, that we will ask ourselves this question. Are we saved? Do we have a record of when we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior? Father, I pray, Lord, that your work would be done. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed as my wife plays through at the cross. Can I ask you this question this morning? Nobody looking around, just me and Charlie. If you know for sure, K-N-O-W, you know that your sins have been forgiven and you have an eternal home in heaven, would you just testify that by raising your hand right where you stand? Nobody looking around but me and Charlie. I know for sure. I have a moment of wonderful praise the Lord to see you because you're here. I wonder if there'd be somebody here today this morning say, you know what? Preacher, I'm not sure. I don't know. Would you be willing to just slip your hand up and raise it high just so I can see it? I won't call you forward or embarrass you out in any way. just want to be able to pray for you as we close our service here today. Anybody say, you know what, I'm not sure that I'm saved. You know, for 
those of us who know for sure that we're saved? Are you sharing the good word of salvation with other people? I imagine we all know people that we work with, friends, family, that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I hope that you will make it a point this week to ask God to lead you to people that you can share the gospel with the good news of salvation so that they also can trust Christ as their first Savior and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven. If we can be a help to you in any way today, once the service is concluded, I'll be here with Charlie B at the back. If you have any questions, we'd love to be a help to you. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your word that promises to us eternal life, a life without end. Thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We love you. Help us to serve you because of your graciousness to us. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. If I can be a help to you in any way, I'm here. We'll love the opportunity to do so.